Welcome to Everything Co-op, bringing you information on how cooperatives can help improve your quality of life. This show is being sponsored by the National Co-op Bank, NCB. The NCB is dedicated to strengthening communities nationwide for the delivery of banking and financial services for the nation's cooperatives, their members, and other socially responsible organizations. For more information on the power of community ownership, visit ncb.coop. That's ncb.coop. Now stay tuned for your host, Vernon Oaks. Good morning, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks, and welcome to Everything Cooperative. This morning, we have a lot of rain in the DMV. Good rain. We need that rain for our trees and our flowers and our food. And Mr. Rudy Hanley is on with us this morning. Good morning, Rudy. Good morning. How are you? Sir, I am doing great. Thanks so very much for taking time out to come and talk to us about your illustrious, your career. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) So you were inducted in the Hall of Fame with three other people a couple weeks ago. How was that for you? Well, you know, it's a great honor, obviously, and and it's a... It's a wonderful organization, and to be in the Hall of Fame is obviously a humbling and and a privilege. Um, I kind of always have reservations about these honors because we all know that uh, one person doesn't really be able to do all the things that they give them credit for. It's, It's a function of hundreds and, in my case, thousands of people who have uh, agreed and, and passionately carried out the philosophy and worked very hard. And so I see myself as the representative of, of those people. They can't put all those people on the stage, so they pick one to pick up the honors, but it really belongs to to all those people over the years that have been had made all those successes possible. So that sounds like you're a true cooperator. It's the whole group. It's not just the individual. I exactly. I, it's, we're part of a of a system that appeals to all of us, and I think that's why there's a lot of passion uh, in the people who who work in this industry. So, I hear a little accent. <laughs> yes, I'm I'm Hungarian. I escaped from Hungary with my family uh, after the revolution in '56. So, if you were trying to get in today, they may not even want to let you in. You're immigrant. Well, uh, you know, it's it's funny though because. Uh, when we escaped uh, from communists, the communists be- defeated the freedom fighters and took over the country. Uh, and there were lots of executions and and things going on. So our family was able to escape. But we did uh, wait in Austria uh, for the U.S. Congress to increase the quota from 19,000 to 37,000 Hungarians that they were willing to admit uh, to basically assist not only the refugees, but uh, the Austrian government who had a lot of refugees refugees sitting there, and uh, need, needed to have a sponsor who was willing to take the financial burden if the people coming in were unable to uh, be gainfully employed and uh, went through background checks and uh, Ellis Island and uh, and uh, were issued a green card at the time when everything cleared. Uh, so yes, I feel like we're uh, refugees, but we're also our uh, respect the the uh, sovereignty and the decisions of the country, and we just feel very honored and lucky to have been able to come into this country. What's the lucky? What's the lucky part? Why? Why do you I think the lucky part is is more than than anything else. You know, I always maintain that it. I'd rather be lucky than good, and it it just seems you know when I go back over my my life is that uh, luck had a lot more to do with with everything and timing uh, that I didn't control uh, than, uh, than my ability to make things happen. Yeah, what, I'm, what I'm asking you, though, is you're saying you're lucky to come here. What, what, why do you view this as lucky to come to the U.S. versus going to someplace else? Well, you know, number one, we, everybody knows, or at least I know in Hungary, everybody thought that the greatest place on earth was the United States. So everybody had a desire to be here and saw the benefits. In fact, uh, it's funny because over there, uh, I think people felt like the, st- the streets were paved with gold. Okay. Uh, you had to do is bend over and pick it up, <laughs> uh, which is, you know, not quite that good. Uh, <laughs> 
but uh, but you know, so you had a lot of people who wanted to come here, and yes, there were other countries who were also were very generous and kind to the refugees and took them in. But the opportunities that this country offers, and you know, for the cooperative system, United States is a perfect example. I mean, that one member, one vote philosophy, the democratic philosophy, is basically uh, what the co-op uh, co-ops believe and practice. Yeah, that's, that is quite interesting that sometimes people in the 50s and 60s called cooperatives uh, communistic or socialistic or other than democratic institutions, and it gave it a bad name. But it's, very, it's the most democratic, and some people call it the small D versus the U.S. economy as the big D or the political system as a big D. But I find that the cooperatives are, are the big D and that people are much more active and involved in the co-op than they are in the U.S. government in terms of the number of people that can vote, that come out and vote, the number of people that get involved. As, as I've traveled the world, though, the reason I ask you about the luckiness, I found that people want to come to the U.S. because of the opportunities, but there's also the opportunities for their children with education. Absolutely. That that too often in Places around, for instance, I went to Sierra Leone, West Africa, and at the time in the early 90s, it, it cost somebody $10 a month to send their kid to school, and the GDP per capita, the average income for somebody in Sierra Leone was $10 a month. Mm -hmm. So it, you had to be on the wealthy side in order to send your child to school. Everybody could not go to school. Right. And that's why this system of... Uh, what happens in the U.S. is that people can, I guess the gold is in the education. The streets pay with gold. It, you, you get it if you get the education. Yeah. Exactly. And obviously also the economic system and, and uh, uh, all the other things that uh, our forefathers and this country has uh, made possible. But you're absolutely right about the education part. And in fact, um, you know, my, my dad was 46 and my mom was 40 when we escaped from Hungary with nothing but the clothes on our back. Um, and they knew that in their lifetime, they were never going to have it better uh, because of the difficulty with the language, the difficulty of the kinds of jobs that they can do. They, they were making a huge sacrifice, especially in the, with respect to they left all the family behind and people don't even appreciate the culture uh, we never understood the culture, and even I, to this day, even though I've been here over 60 years, um, it's, it's, it's an adjustment. And for an older person, that's a real sacrifice. But they really weren't escaping for them. They gave all of that up for us, the, our, the children, because under communism is the same thing, same experience as you just stated, is that if, most people, especially if you're not part of the Communist Party, uh, if you if your parents didn't belong to the Communist Party, eighth grade was it. After mm. that, you have nowhere to go except usually uh, labor, manual labor. Uh, so yes, this country is what it is in large part to to uh, to help people even with limited income to take advantage of the educational opportunity, and of course that that changes their whole life financially and otherwise. So what you were saying was in the Communist Party, because I've never heard this before, was that the most you could go to was the eighth grade, unless right. you, if you were in the, if you were in the, if your parents were in the Communist Party, there may be opportunities beyond that. Yeah, then then it was limited to those who really had the promise of being able to achieve. You know, it's kind of like the college entry system here, but otherwise you were just totally left out. Okay, so how many brothers and how many siblings were there that came over? So how many siblings do you have? <laughs> I have I have one uh, one brother. Okay. So with you and your brother, your mom and your dad, you you make it over here. You you go and then. So what was your? How old were you at that time? Fourteen. Okay. So did you go right into school? Uh, yes, we went to uh, what they call the foreign adjustment branch of a, of a junior high school in in California in uh, East Los Angeles. And about six months later, when we mastered the language enough, then they streamlined us into the regular curriculum. Okay. So 
Were you in junior high or high school at that point? Fifteen. That was. Uh, I lost the. I, we lost a year because of all the transition and everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I was in the eighth grade, the same as the grade I was in when we escaped. Okay. So now you in the eighth grade, you finish high school, you went to college. I I wanted to, but we were um, obviously uh, financially not well. So what I decided to do is uh, to go in the Army. Okay. And then after I got out of the Army, then under the GI Bill, I was able to go to school. Okay. So what degree did you get, and where did you go? I went to University of California in Irvine, uh, and I got a a BA in, in mathematics and a teaching credential. And so I went into teaching when I graduated. So you were about 26, 27 years old when you graduated. Right. And actually a little older, I would think I was 28, uh, okay. because uh, there was some lapse of time between uh, graduating from high school and going into service and, you know, just a little uh, time mm-hmm. to go from one step to the other. Okay. We're going to have to take a break here. It's a fascinating background in history of coming over from Hungary out of communism taking over. Wow, your parents 46 and 40, and you were 14, and then get a, try to get adjusted, and you say you're not even adjusted to the culture yet. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's funny. I still feel sometimes more comfortable when we're in Hungary than here, just, be, <laughs> just fitting in. Okay, I got it. I understand. All right. What did you do after college? You taught mathematics. Right, right. That, okay. That, That's exactly, I taught mathematics. I got an undergrad degree in mathematics also, math and chemistry, and I taught math right out of college. Uh, oh, similar background. Similar, yeah. We're going to take a first break, and then we'll be right back. Uh, please don't touch that dial. Information is power. That's why WOL makes a great, great, great partner because the National Co-op Bank is sponsoring this program to give you information. Now, the only thing about information, though, you've got to use it in order to get the power out of it. It's like stored energy, um, like a can of gasoline. There's no power when you just have a can of gasoline. You've got to put some, put some kind of action toward it to get the power. So we want you to... Take the energy, take the energy, take the information that you're learning here and go do something with it. Find a co-op or start a co-op so that you can help solve your community problems. And we have Mr. Rudy Hanley uh, who came to the U.S. They migrated in 1956. The communists took over their country in Hungary and his parents came over here with the two children so that they could have a, opportunities they would not have had there. So you went to the Army out of high school, uh, came back and went to University of California at Irvine, got a math degree, and started teaching. So how was that like for you, Rudy, this oh, teaching thing? Y- you know, it, it was funny because I had I had actually hoped to go into uh, some kind of a, a business, uh, but uh, there were no uh, – it was a recession when I graduated, and so I, I decided that the best thing was uh, teaching with its uh, security, job security, and so on. Uh, and I wound up loving that, now that I reflect back, uh, loving that more than anything else that I've done in my life. Wow. What year is that? That was 72 is when I started teaching, uh, and I was, I was in it for eight years. Well, I, I did my first year in 1969 in Cleveland, Ohio. I grew up in Blue, Bluefield, West Virginia, small. And my mother went back to school and graduated when I was 13. And I didn't realize until she passed that she majored in business administration. Mm. And I assume a, a black woman in Bluefield, West Virginia, could not start a school, a, a business. or And she ended up teaching. And I knew how hard she worked and how little she got paid and little respect that the community gave gave teachers. So I never wanted to teach. Uh-huh. But I taught to keep from going to Vietnam. And 
I ended up loving it, and I was told I was pretty good at it. Yeah, well, usually when you love it, you you're good at it, and that's one of the one of the lucky things in my life is I always had jobs that I loved. <laughs> okay, yeah, I I I like this teaching thing. I like I like when people get it. That's the best compensation I've ever had is when the light turned on when somebody mm-hmm. gets that whatever you're trying to accomplish you can see it happening right. um, so you're teaching and you find out you really love it so and you did it for eight years I taught for 12 I think I total so what did you do next well you know as you know that uh, teachers were especially back then were not paid all that well but I had uh, I I taught summer school and and got paid, uh, but I think it was five hundred sixty-two dollars for a eight-week session of summer school. And a friend of mine told me about uh, the Credit Union National Association uh, preparing a white paper uh, about credit unions and uh, financially how they uh, how they're doing the growth patterns, the philosophy, all of that. And they needed somebody to work on that five uh, white paper. And we're willing to pay five thousand uh, dollars, and I, I could take the summer and work in Washington and prepare that white paper. Well, you know, the difference between five hundred and five thousand. Well, it's a little bit. I, you you don't, don't have to be a you don't. mathematician. <laughs> I was going to say the same thing. <laughs> uh, so I did that, and I I didn't know anything about cooperatives or credit unions, uh, but I studied. Uh, and I, I did a lot of reading, Library of Congress and ABA statistics and so on, and prepared the white paper. And there were two things that really impressed me. Uh, number one, I, I obviously fell in love with the people helping people philosophy of, of credit unions and I think cooperatives across the board. Um, and the credit unions had the other slogan was, uh, not for charity, not for profit, but for service. And that service aspect and that philosophical aspect really appealed to me. And when I, after I learned that, I kind of thought, but financially, how can these organizations make it work? Because they're not a charity. They don't get money. But yet they do a lot of things that are not economically all the way thought through because their number one objective is to make their members' lives better, not to make money. And how can they compete with for-profits? And how can this work? Well, I Never figured out how it worked, but it did work. When I looked at the financial position of credit unions, the growth rates and all the ratios and everything, they were the, they were financially more successful than banks and other for-profit financial institutions that focused on financials. Uh, and so the combination of those two things said, you know, when I grew up, I think I want to work in this industry, okay. this movement. I said ten years ago when I grow up, and I'm, I'm, I'm I'll be seventy one this year. But ten years ago, I said when I grow up, I want to promote and develop co ops. Mm-hmm. So I figured out only about ten years ago what I want to do when I grow up. So you said back then when you grew up, you want to be in this world because you said some interesting things. Not for charity, not for profit, but for service mm-hmm. and people helping people. And and in, even in that. They were more successful, financially successful than banks or other financial institutions. Did you right. figure out why? I mean, like now, looking back, and you didn't figure it out then. Well, I, I you know, I surmised, and you know, I'm not a, a scholar of uh, economics or or any of the areas that would be affecting this. But I came to the conclusion uh, just from uh, the experiences, just the little bits of pieces of information, is that when an organization has a clear focus on what it is about, the purpose that is really clear to everybody, and if that purpose is something that touches your heart uh, rather than just your pocketbook, uh, the combination of those two things uh, drive you to dedicate yourself, and, and teachers, you know, fall in that category to some extent or mm-hmm. to a large extent, that the combination of those two things is what sets you apart. And so I practiced and built uh, everything that we did on that, and it worked worked out very well. And again, I'm not the, the creator, I'm just a student, uh, but uh, that's, what, that's what the 
credit union movement taught me. Okay, so let's go now. When you said I did X and I did what? How did how did you get then get into this credit union movement? And the credit unions are co-ops. They're called a consumer co-op because the people that make the deposit own the business and they elect right. a board of directors. So how did you get into it after you did a white paper? And you made well, $5,000. Yeah, I, I, after I, I finished the white paper and came back to California, uh, the California Credit Union League, which is the trade association at the state level, had an opening in research and information where a lot of the background that I had, I could use. And they hired me. I applied and hired me and worked there for a couple of years uh, and did a lot of the – that's when the Monetary Control Act of 1980 uh, was passed by Congress, which gave credit unions additional powers. And it had – a lot of the powers had to do with uh, areas that I had worked in while I was teaching. Uh, And so they hired me, and we put on conferences and – and education you know, sessions uh, for credit unions, and I got exposed to the people who run day-to-day operations. And I was fortunate enough that at time Orange County Teachers uh, Credit Union, which now is schools first, uh, was looking for a CEO. The CEO was retiring, and he and I, through these conferences, we, we got to know each other. And uh, so I was fortunate enough to get the CEO job there. Uh, it's a teacher's credit union, so I, I had a, a, lot, a, a little more information and empathy for what they were going through. And so I, again, was very lucky. Everything fell in place, and, and I got the job. So you're in the right place at the right time. You're, you, you know about credit unions. You've done research about credit unions. You've taught for eight years, and now there's a credit union that's called teachers, California Teachers Credit Union at the time. They need a CEO. They need somebody to run the place, chief executive officer. And you've met this person, and you get that job. Yep. Wow. <laughs> what year was that? Lucky. <laughs> you know, that's, that's where lucky comes from. <laughs> yeah. And by the way, I do want to uh, go back. I, I think I used I uh, a lot because of talking about what I perceived and what I learned and all of that. But my uh, total belief is I is a, first of all, you know, in Hungarian, I is small letter, and you are large uh, capital. Wow. Uh, and so I, I am a firm believer that there's a good reason for that because I cannot accomplish anything alone. Uh, and it was always we. Uh, and a lot of people, including my predecessor and the organization he built, uh, that made the accomplishments possible. Okay. What year was that now that you became the CEO? 1982. 1982. Okay. We're going to take our we're going to take a break, a second break and we'll come back Rudy. We want to really get into the kinds of things you were able to do. The credit union knows their members, you know the teachers, you've been one. So most credit unions will create products that the the members need. And the members are the owners and so they can tell you what they need. So I want to talk about some of the kinds of things you learned. And I understand there was only one branch when you became the CEO. Correct. We'll be right back. Washington, D.C.'s News Talk, 1450 AM, WOS, and 95.9 FM. Welcome back, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks. The program is Everything Cooperative. The program is brought to you by the National Cooperative Bank, who's the main supporter, uh, Chuck Hanley and the, Chuck, Chuck Snyder. And the people at uh, NCB have just really... More than provide money, they do what what happens in this cooperative world. They've been such inspirational leaders, and they motivate. And they, they we took an idea to them, and they said, "Great, let's try this." And they've been right there with us for a little over four and a half years now. Rudy Rudy Hanley is our guest. He's retired from School First Credit Union in California. He started, as we just learned, in 1982 as a CEO of what at the time was called California Teachers Credit Union. 
No, it was Orange County teachers. Orange County teachers. Okay, yeah. Orange County. Now, what I did notice in 1972 when you started teaching, that's the year I went to California in San Diego. I was teaching at mathematics at San Diego State. I got my master's at oh. math from Penn State, and I was teaching oh. beginning math classes through stats, um, mainly algebra and statistics, mm-hmm. um, and trying to... And this is where the first time I really saw where when the light came on, those students, they were mainly African-Americans and Latino that didn't think that they could do math. Mm-hmm. And then the, once they got it, boy, they were on their way. Now, you have a interesting background in that you all migrated here from Hungary. And so you were 28 when you graduated from college after going into the Army. Right. And... Doing some research on credit unions, you 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 got that how successful uh, credit unions are, and so you became you had a opportunity that came in front of you. You grabbed it in 1982. You became the chief executive officer of Orange County, Orange County Teachers Teachers Credit Union. Right. Got it. So you were just right up the street from me in San Diego in 19 well, yep. yeah 1972 and then 1982. I didn't well by 82 I had. I only taught there a couple of years, and then I went to Stanford and got an MBA, and then in 82, I was traveling around the world. No, I was living in Puerto Rico in 82. Okay, so let's talk about you had one branch and $150 million in assets when you took over. Right. So what, what are some of the kinds of the products that you work with the members to create and the staff to create for teachers? Well, you know, as you said earlier, is that since being a, a, a teacher's grant, actually, though, we were called Orange County Teachers, but we were always an, uh, an educator, school employees credit union. Okay. Uh, but the majority of the members were teachers, and the board of directors were administrators and teachers. Uh, in credit unions, the board has to come from the membership, so they have to be eligible for membership in order to join, and then they have to be a member to become a board member. Anyway, so they were all educators, and so they also knew I, again, I didn't have to have all the wherewithal because I had a lot of help from a wonderful board. And so they already had products like uh, summer skips on loans so that you didn't have to make payments on your auto loan during the summer. Wait, Uh, wait, wait, wait a minute. I didn't have to pay my loan for my car during the summer? Wait, You're right. I, the, I, okay, the, I wish I could have joined that. Particularly back then, no, teaching, no, you didn't make no money. <laughs> no, no, remember, the balance stayed and actually interest kept accumulating, but you didn't have to make payment. So that way you, you could uh, take the summer off and, and not have to work. Okay. Okay, so, so they had, that, that was, a, well, was a feature. The other uh, feature that uh, the credit union had uh, when I joined was a summer saver. And again, these were all products that were uh, created to suit the needs. So instead of, of a holiday saver or Christmas saver account, they had a summer saver account. And they were set up with very favorable conditions and rates uh, so that the, the, the product also helped as far as how much interest they had to pay or how much dividends they received. So the summer saver, if it works like a Christmas saver, you, they would put money in the nine or ten months that they worked. Right. And to, so they have money over the summer. Right. And then they draw it out over, over a two-month period, two- or three-month period in, during the summer. Okay. All right, that's neat. Now, I always, when I was, even at San Diego State, I, would, I taught at the junior college in the evenings to, to make enough money, and I taught summer school. Always taught mm-hmm. summer school. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you had a summer saver, you had a skip payments. Uh, any other kind of products that you all did? What about mortgages? Did you all have, offer mortgages? Yeah. You know, credit unions' powers, especially before 1980, were pretty, pretty limited. And so we could do mortgage loans only because we were state licensed. Under the federal act, it was still... Uh, very limited as to what products and services you can offer. But my predecessor's predecessor uh, was uh, was in heavy into real estate, so he was very creative. 
and under the State Credit Union Act, I uh, was able to introduce. So when I got there, a uh, good part of the portfolio, loan portfolio, was in mortgage loans. And what really benefits both the, the credit union and its members was that the field of members, like in any good cooperative, are owners, and they have a special sense of responsibility. And so our loss ratios uh, were much lower than anybody else, and we had the loyalty of the members, so we were able to do some of those things like mortgage loans and, and seconds because of the, the solid membership that we had. Oh, wait a minute. Now, and when you talk about have, loss, when you talk about, I'm going to go back to this loss, this loss thing, because mm-hmm. I've been told that poor people and people that don't have a lot of money, they don't pay their bills while they have bad credit scores and so forth. And most teachers, including my mom and me, while I was teaching, we didn't have any money. I mean, I think you probably learned early on, like some of the lessons I learned, is there was more month than money, I mean, in your right. household. Right. Okay. Okay. That's so, right. <laughs> and as, as teachers, there was almost no money in the summertime unless you – I mean, there was teachers that would cut grass in the summertime and sure. paint houses. There was always some some kind of – you had to get out and hustle – to do what you love doing, like you talked about, and that's teaching somebody else's children. But you created so, but there was less losses. Why was that? People pay well, their bills. What? What? Why? Well, several several pieces to it. In one part, because they were members of this organization, the loyalty factor is much greater. They they were, they felt responsible. Uh, and anyway, teachers uh, are very responsible people as a, as in general. But they felt like even if things were tight, they were committed to making payments. And the credit union, on the other hand, uh, again, because of the special relationship, which is there in co-ops, the credit union was willing to more willing to work with them so that in the long run, they were able to meet their financial obligation, even though it may not have been on the original schedule, uh, just were able to work things out with them. Uh, so those factors, and then obviously at the granting stage, is making sure that uh, you were there to assist in their planning of what to buy and how much to how much to pay for, how much to borrow, uh, with their interest in mind, not the credit unions, but the members' interest, which in the long run obviously made the credit unions stronger too. So you didn't want them to buy too much house have too big of a payment like the whole reason that the 2007 2008 recession hit exactly was that the the greed in the capitalistic society was you you sell them anything more than they can pay for and you give them a low interest and then a high interest rate knowing that they're going to fault on it there was no way not to default on those loans but in the credit union you're looking for the benefit of the members what's best for the members and exactly. so then you're teaching and counseling and coaching them on, okay, how much house to buy here? Yeah. Okay. Let, me, let me just tell you a story. I don't, I, I don't, I don't want to take too much time on it. But one day I got a call from a lady, one of our members, and she says, you got to talk to my daughter because she wants to buy this brand new car and she can't afford it. And I want you to talk to her about what this will do to her financial situation in the long haul. And so I got on the phone with her daughter and convinced her that instead of a, I think it was $18,000 new car, she could get an $8,000 used car that would meet her, her needs and demonstrated the points uh, of, of what it, the implications in her financial situation and long-term benefits and so forth. Uh, and again, it was just the kind of things that the credit union did all the time. Again, I did it this time, but this was a practice of the credit union done by my predecessors and by people up and down the chain. Uh, but she decided, uh, to my surprise, a teenage girl <laughs> decided that she was going to go with a used car. Well, you know, as, as a as a parent, uh, that they will listen to other people before they sure. listen to the parents. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what the member said. She won't listen to me. Yeah, she right. thinks I don't know anything, but maybe she will listen to you, and she did. <laughs> yes. Uh, but but so here's the, the scenario I'm hearing you, you, you talk about. You counsel the members, and the members are there, and you're looking for what's best for the member long term. Um, Correct. And so you create products 
like I see where it says for mortgage loans, you had no PMI. You didn't have this mortgage right. insurance. Right, mortgage insurance, right. So that, that mortgage insurance would cause the, the interest, the, the, the rate, their monthly payments to go up. You had low down payments. And then you had reduced fees. So if you have reduced fees, that means they pay less. Right. And then by paying less, by buy, by buying what they need as opposed to what they want or this big house or bigger car or new or whatever, then they can more likely make the payments and they will make the payments and everybody ends up better off. <laughs> less Correct. stress in the family and they get a home that they need or a car they need or whatever and uh, they pay their they can pay and do pay back, and therefore that's one of the reasons the credit unions are more successful. Mm-hmm. You make that right? Is that what I'm hearing? That's from correct. You? That's absolutely right. Wow. And that's the nature of the cooperatives, right? I mean, yeah. that that is that is really the distinguishing difference. Yeah, in every co-op, but I really like that you're able to come on and explain to us about the credit union and how the credit union works, and particularly. Your family coming out of communistic, at least a communistic country that took over, and then coming to a democratic country, and then working in co-ops that are one member, one vote. That's right. But they are. Right. And they work, and they work really well. And and yes, and the democratic system showed us that one person, one vote is is what what it makes the difference. Not how much money they have, but how much. Uh, but that that they they rep they are just as important as the members with uh, large deposits. Then, Rudy, what's here for me right now is why we don't have more credit unions and less money in banks, or how we don't this co-op. Why hasn't it functioned so much better than it has in the U.S.? Now it's all around the world. And I want to hold that question until we come back off a break. Why aren't there more people don't know more about co-ops? There's more into co-ops because they really work. And it, Dame Pauline Green, who was the president of the International Cooperative Alliance, said that co-ops help people to come out of poverty with dignity. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the reasons I love them. And we're going to take our final break and we'll come back and see if you can answer that question for us. Washington, D.C.'s News Talk, 1450 AM, WOS, and 95.9 FM. Information is power. That's why National Corporate Bank is sponsoring this program. NCB's mission is, is to support and be an advocate for America's cooperatives and their members, especially in low-income communities, by providing innovative financial and related services. And I know, Rudy, the NCB does work with credit unions, and you all have figured out ways of using the sixth principle of cooperation among co-ops. But why why aren't there more co-ops, Rudy, or why why aren't there more financial credit unions? And there seems to be that some credit unions are going under or the government is making the smaller ones merge with larger ones. What's what's all that about? Okay, I I think it's not the government that's creating the mergers. In fact, I, I had at times worked with NCOA, which is the regulator for credit unions, National Credit Union Administration, uh, in trying to uh, do things that will encourage not only maintaining the small credit unions uh, and making them prosper, but also uh, creating new uh, credit unions. Uh, the, the, it's really the economy and, and technology and some of the, the economic developments over the years that had, did create some real challenges, especially for full, smaller credit unions. Uh, number one, a lot of niche players entered the market. Uh, you know, well, uh, Nordstrom's has its own bank. Uh, so they're, they're, they're these players who are competing. Uh, technology has created the need for size. Uh, and to okay. offer all the technological products is very expensive, so it's hard for small credit unions to get to satisfy the needs of their membership. 
Now, I believe and have some experience in that, but uh, if the credit union becomes a niche player, a small credit union, they can make it work. My wife uh, had a $15 million, ran a $15 million credit union, and yes, their product line was very limited, but they did make it work. It just becomes a lot more challenging, and it also um, makes it very difficult for them to grow. And as you know, expenses go up, and if you can't keep up the growth, uh, you're, sooner or later you're going to have to find a solution. And merger a lot of times is actually a good thing for both. But I agree with your comment that it can be a negative if you just get these credit unions that are maybe getting too large and but especially to me, it's not the size. It's getting away from the credit union philosophy, from the cooperative philosophy. And I'm happy to say that while that happens here and there, a lot of the credit unions, no matter how big, and Navy Federal is a, is a perfect example. Navy Federal is about $75, $80 billion in assets, but they have stuck to the cooperative philosophy, the credit union philosophy, and they are growing and are successful financially and sticking to the philosophy, and I think that's why they're still successful. Uh, Schools First is a perfect example. Uh, went from $150 million to now they're almost $15 billion, uh, and still the philosophy and the way everything is done is the same. And at this meeting uh, where they were doing the honors, um, one of the people from working in, uh, from one of the, in one of the co-ops, uh, not credit unions, said, you know, why is it that the, the co-ops are the best kept secret? Mm-hmm. Why aren't there more co-ops? And I hear that in credit unions all the time. We're the best kept secret. And I don't know if I can put my finger on it, but I tell you, uh, today there are over 100 million uh, members of credit unions. Uh, and it's been growing at a pretty good pace. I think it's running at about 4% increase in membership and they're over a trillion dollars, the combined assets of credit unions. So the fact is, it's growing and it is successful and there are people finding out. But you're right, I do not know why uh, there, there are not uh, more people who are aware and who are joining credit unions when those benefits are there for the most part in every instance. Yeah, I... Um... I'm glad you cleared that up about the technology and the costs because I was told once that it was because the federal government had made rules that they could only be so big or they couldn't be – they had to be a certain size in order to stay in or they had to – That was an attempt. Uh, Bankers attempted in 1997 or so, attempted to limit credit union size and how they need to be structured. And, in fact, the Supreme Court upheld – uh, that decision to change the the authority of credit unions, but I think it was in '97 or so. Uh, no, maybe it was earlier. It, it's in the '90s, someplace there, uh, where HR 1151 was passed by Congress, that does give credit unions the power to uh, serve the the field of membership and to and to modify that field of membership. Uh, and so, since then, credit unions have been successful. There are also uh, some con- some restraints by the by the regulator, National Credit Union Administration, uh, and that sometimes gets in the way of of smaller credit unions because of the capital ratios and some of the other things that they require. But even that, I think, is not the main reason uh, anymore. I think we have some understanding and working relationship with the regulator does go to extremes sometimes, uh, and then they back off a little bit. But the biggest, the economics is the biggest part of it. Okay. Now, I want to go to the the principle number six, cooperatives helping co-ops. I went out to Southern, to San Diego, and spoke at the California Center for Cooperative Development a couple weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And YOLO Eco Clean Co-op is uh, Latinas have created their own cleaning cooperative. Mm -hmm. And they talked about how this one food co-op gave them the business and taught them how to clean the food place. So they, it it was a real mutual sort of training and teaching and, and they're using um, 
ecological cleaning, uh, uh, you know, products. And I thought, well, maybe there's something that there, I think they're in Davis is their main place, but there might be, you all have 45 credit unions. So I don't know how far up the state you all go or whatever, but maybe there might be some way that help them get some cleaning contracts of, of your branches, which is mm-hmm. 45 branches. Yeah, we have 45 branches, but the furthest north is like, uh, LA, where the LA, LA, LAX is, uh, the, the, uh, Inglewood, but you know that is an, a perfect example. And and as co-ops, you you de- do need to work together. And and uh, if at all possible, you certainly would want to uh, work with these uh, with these co-ops. Uh, I don't know if specifically this one is something that would fit into the credit union's field of membership, because we are limited to serving school employees. But uh, another a perfect example of what you're describing is that there are certain segments of our society that uh, can create, that can be a common bond that holds these people together. And in Southern California, uh, as you know, if you were in San Diego, there are a lot of Latinos. And we at our credit union try to uh, do a better job serving them uh, and then discover that if you're if you if you blur the focus, you might be losing some of the effectiveness. So at that time, Orange County Teachers created what uh, eventually we named uh, or was named Comunidad Latina Credit Union, and uh, and the Teachers Credit Union decided that and, and Schools First now is that by supporting that effort uh, and and helping them. Uh, they could do a great job serving uh, the Latino members of, of our credit union in general. So in Santa Ana, it's, I was just talking to the CEO, uh, and it's still being supported uh, significantly by schools first, but uh, they are standing on their own, and they're up to $5 million now uh, in assets and helping, helping the Latino community. Well, it seems like what, what co-ops can do a lot, any marginalized people, whether – First generation immigrants or Latinas or because the Mexican American, I mean they they own California at one point I think and That's and, right and then you got you got so in a way they never immigrated they were there first but African Americans or any group that's marginalized it's so crazy you know, people coming together working working together to solve whatever those community problems are in this case it's financial if they need books, or I saw you had another program for teachers for school supplies, whatever it is, because that's what I always, how much my mother put back into this classroom, okay? Right. Didn't make any money, but she was always buying something for the bulletin board or for supplies for the kids or right. some kind of snacks or something. So, yeah, I saw you had loans for that. I mean, it's amazing what you've done, and we only have another minute or so, so what kind of message would you like to leave people with? What and it's found a minute. Well, one, uh, what you had mentioned is uh, become aware of uh, eligibility and and the existence of credit unions in your area, and uh, whenever possible, make a make a, a comparison. And I think you decide that uh, credit unions can meet your financial needs better than than the other alternatives. Uh, and secondly to recognize the benefit of this cooperative philosophy. And a lot of the times it's philosophical, but by participating in a cooperative, you're actually not only helping yourself, but you are helping uh, people like what you were talking about, the disadvantaged uh, people who don't have the power or the the voice that they deserve uh, by joining together and collectively able to do things that individually it may take a lot more and most of us never would get into that category. Uh, and, and that spirit uh, and the support for that cooperative, I think, is something that makes this country even stronger. Thank you, Rudy. Thank you so very much. Thank you, everybody out there. We'll see you next Thursday and live cooperatively this week. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Washington, D.C.'s News Talk, 1450 AM, WOS, and 95.9 FM.